good. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, today we're going to be talking, um, well, in, Andrew Lotto, who is a hurricane specialist at the National Hurricane Center, is going to be uh, giving an overview of tropical cyclone track guidance models that are used at the National Hurricane Center. Um, this is intended to give people who are working with NHC or working with NHC products an idea of how the thought processes um, go in estimating track and in particular focusing on how NHC forecasters use the model to make track forecasts. Um, just so you know, we are going to have everyone muted uh, during this call and we will have uh, open it up at the end of the uh, presentation part for questions for, for Andy. So go ahead, Andy. Everybody, thank you for having me. <clears throat> so I'm going to be going over this week uh, in uh, next week will be about intensity, but this week I'm going to talk about tropical cyclone track guidance, how we use them at Hurricane Center. <clears throat> so we're going to go over basically by the end of this, we'll uh, see what the various models are we use for track. Um, we're going to go over a little bit of the strengths and weaknesses of each of the models understand how they're actually used and uh, building these consensus models. And there's several of them actually that exist, these consensus models. Um, and we're going to go over a little bit of how the um, forecast model improvements, but also how some of these have also been, uh, performed in recent years. So we're going to go through basically a reminder of how tropical cyclone motion works um, and a list of the track models that we use. Uh, and the data that's incorporated into these models and what they use to actually simulate what's going to happen with these storms. Um, I'll describe what late and early models are, uh, show you some of the ensemble consensus models that are available, and we'll go through this overview of the model verification. So the basics, uh, the main steering mechanisms for tropical cyclones, we like this to call it the cork in the stream or the leaf in the stream, where it's the mean prevailing flow, environmental flow, that takes these things along. Um, so if you have a large ridge to the north of the, of the system, it'll tend to track from east to west. If you have a large trough, a southwesterly flow around the trough, and the system's interacting with it, it'll tend to recurve the storm off to the northeast. So you have, uh, the, so we're talking about the steering led deep layer mean environmental wind. That's those steering currents I'm talking about. But there's other factors that play into it, um, and the beta effects depend on the storm size. Your large storms affect a little bit more. Uh, so you might have, especially, a more tendency to drift northwest when you have weak steering flow. But there's always a player in there. It's just that you might not see it because the other steering flows are so much stronger of factors. Uh, when systems interact with land, sometimes it's frictional forcing that helps turn the storm a little bit. Um, and then other small-scale oscillations, like uh, the storm happens to have an inner core that's redeveloping. You can tend to have large wobbles with these storms temporarily. Um, that can have a large effect, especially if the storm, you know, is expected to miss you by 30 miles and it wobbles the last second, so that can have a large uh, impact on um, who gets these effects of the storms. So I'm going to start off by showing you is very, uh, everybody sees these all the time, spaghetti plot. And this is from Hurricane Joaquin. I'm going to go through some of these examples from Joaquin later on in the talk after I go through the model information. Um, but we have to ask ourselves when we're at the Hurricane Center making the forecast, um, you know, which each line, we have to know which each line means, obviously, um, which ones are accurate, accurately conveying the uncertainty in the track forecast. So you look at this plot and you say, like, okay, well, how much uncertainty is there in the forecast? Typically, if they're more clustered, it's more confident, but if there's a large spread, there's less confidence. Are they all created equal? No, they're not created equal, and we're going to go over that here in a minute. Um, and what's missing? Well, not every model is always in there. Um, and there's other information available that can help us determine what the steering mechanism might be without, in addition to what we're looking at here in the spaghetti plots. So basically a list here from um, starting up the top to the bottom. I want to go over the details here in the next slide. The statistical models, the clipper, climatology persistence, uh, is used as a baseline. Um, and simplified dynamical models, the uh, tad tab M, tab D, those shallow, medium, and deep trajectory beta models. These are um, basically a simplified model. Uh, they take the steering flow and add a little bit of beta drift to it to try to determine, based off the GFS, where the storm may go. Uh, dynamical models, we're getting to the more complex ones. We're going to talk about the GFS, European models, UK, Med, Canadian models, 
Uh, the global ones are those, and the regional dynamic hole are the H work, H mon, and then the Navy coams TC. Then we have consensus forecasts, which is a com combination of some of the models I just listed above and various combinations and various weightings. Um, and I'll show you some of those um, combinations here in a few minutes. Uh, ensemble forecast systems, we're talking about you know, European Ensemble. They have 50 members. GFS um, has uh, at least uh, 20 members. Um, and so we can look at those as well to try to determine um, not only where the system may be going, but how much uncertainty we need to build into our forecast. So starting off with the Clipper model, it's the most basic um, back in 1972, it was created. Uh, basically, all it takes is the current, the 12-hour old speed and direction, current location, and the intensity in the day, and it projects it out in time. Um, it's basically a benchmark. So if we are forecasting worse than the Clipper, we have no skill. And so typically, we want, but we always want the numbers to be better than Clipper than what we're forecasting, essentially. Uh, moving on, the tab model. So these are early models. I say early means I, I input the data into the system. I know the position of the system. Let's say it's zero Z. I put it in there. I hit run guidance, and I had this back in five minutes. Uh, so the trajectory and beta model, uh, these are very simple. There's a shallow, medium, and deep. And I was saying they use the GFS wind fields. Um, they have a little bit of beta drift built into them. Uh, but we have three-layer averages, so they're predefined. So shallow would be 850 to 700 millibars, medium would be 850 to 400, deep would be 850 to 200. So you're looking at these three right here in this diagram <clears throat> pre-set. So that's one of the weaknesses of that model is that it's pre-set. Well, the storm strengthens anywhere along the way, um, and it changes, or the, maybe the mean steering flow is not necessarily those predefined categories. There's going to be a lot of error in those. But at least tells us, um, generally speaking, if we think it's going to be medium strength this whole time, it could head this direction. Or if we think it's going to be deep storm this whole time, it could head this direction. So it kind of provides a little bit of guidance uh, in that regard. The primary dynamical models we use here at the Hurricane Center is GFS, European, UK Met. If there's any, you know, if folks from the NWS online, they know what all these points mean. Uh, regional models. Uh, for folks that are working inland, you might not be more aware of the h and the H-Work. Those are spe specialized for hurricanes um, and coam TC as well. Uh, and so those are useful regional models. They're high-resolution models uh, that, we, that we look at all the time at the hurricane centers, specifically when storms already exist or are about to if we're investigating a disturbance. <clears throat> uh, so a little bit of science here. So going into the horizontal resolution of, of the global models and how it's defined, uh, basically if, uh, what this is saying is that they take the information, they manipulate it, and create the uniform spatial resolution of this data over the entire sphere for the global model. And that way we can ingest all this data and have a proportional at each um, forecast point to create this, uh, these grid point models. And here's a list of all the global models that we have available. The, uh, so the, from top to bottom on the left is the GFS is the AVNI, EMX is European, EGRR is UK Met, MVGM is the NAVGM, um, and then CMC is the Canadian model. And uh, if you, if you, you can refer to this model uh, summary page and link at the bottom if you want to go back and look at all this information. Again, I don't want to go through all these details at this point, but you just this uh, very useful website, the nhc.gov slash model summary, that has a lot of this information available to you, so you can refer back to a lot of this um, this, this uh, detailed data, especially in some of these slides I'm about to go through, you can refer back to it as well. Uh, one of them is, is such as the HWERF. And so basically what they're trying to say here is that the, um, the storm is embedded in tr it, it's three grids, three uh, nested grids. So we have an outermost grid, which is a very large outermost grid, 77 degrees. That's very large. Uh, middle grid, um, you know, more like a regional size. It's uh, roughly um, the 18 degrees. So uh, basically, the distance from here in South Florida to um, up there by New York City. Picture that large. And the innermost grid is very small, very storm specific, right around the storm area. A lot of vertical levels. So it's a very high resolution um, forecast model. 
um, and it, it, it ingests a lot of data. And I'm going to show you a list of that data here in a second. Um, but it also is ocean coupled uh, and has a built in convective scheme to try to create the most realistic scenario possible, especially for intensity um, with the H wharf. And so it's kind of what you see with the H wharf here. So here's the nested grids moving along with the storm in the top left hand corner. Uh, the convective scheme's working on the, on the right. Um, so it's trying to create an idealistic version of what the system could be doing. So you can see kind of a radar image, simulated radar image of a system uh, over southeast Georgia here in this particular example. So I was talking about data simulation. So basically the green means this data that's available in the H-Works. So going back to 2011, there wasn't much available. We just had the GSI-based data. Um, but now, even going from 2019 to 2020, uh, we've now had available the global hawk information, the, uh, the P3 Doppler velocity, satellite radiances, the wind, flight level ops, and just more recently, we're available for all the NEXTRAD, the, the WFOs, Doppler velocities can be embedded into these as well. Very useful as the storms nearing the coast. Um, and additional radiance data has become available too, uh, since we have GOO 16 and 17 out there available. So an upgrade that's occurred this year at the HWRF, um, so now we can use three hourly um, information. Uh, we have the high resolution CMAS. Uh, you see that information there below. And so it helps improve the vortex initialization. Um, there's also additional information we can get from post-processing products. Um, there's other bug fixes that's happened. Um, but the gist of it, they're trying to ongoing improvements every year, and there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to try to improve the H work every year. Um, and this one is, uh, this year is a great example of it because we have the additional data. Um, so kind of, I, I say like the uh, twin model, but not quite. So the H work is the H mon. Very similar. It has the three um, the nested grids, outermost, middle, and innermost grids, same amount of vertical levels, same convective scheme. Um, ocean coupled uses RTOS as well, but has no weight. Um, and the data simulation is much less than, in fact, non existent comparatively to the H wharf. So we have the nested grid um, for the H mon, and that's kind of what it looks like uh, if you look at the map with the grids on there. So the upgrades, uh, they increased the vertical re resolution this year. Uh, they've also increased the um, the physical schemes and initialization schemes. Um, and again, they have other post-processing products available and bug fixes that they worked on as well. So here's side by side what those two particular models look like. Again, that information can be found online at that uh, model summary page I was talking about. So the satellite data, I was talking about the satellite data that um, the H work can ingest. So they're talking about the list, I'm not gonna list all of these, but all the radiances that are now available um, based off of sounders, based off the uh, different microwave radiometers, um, the polar orbiter winds, the, geos the GOES winds, and at ASCAT winds, all of this can be pulled into these models now, uh, which really is valuable in trying to simulate what's going on in the atmosphere. And this is a good example. So this is satellite-based winds, uh, where before we would just, we would have much less data, but look at the, basically, we're, to me, this looks like almost a model um, initialization of wind, but this is actually satellite wind. And so this is very helpful information to pull into the models because they have a great initialization with the data. The specialized aircraft data, I, I, we have actually in our operations now, we get to see the P3 radar data on our screens in AWIPS too, which is really cool. Um, so they're flying on storms in the middle of the ocean, but we get radar. So that's really good when they're out there doing this. Um, and so that data can, can get pulled into the models now. Um, Typically, the GPS droplet sons, that data is available too. Um, and they've done a study back in 2010 that did show um, that this data is available, it decreases track error by up to 25%. And so between the P3s and the U.S. Air Force data, this is very helpful for us. And this shows you an example of what the drop sons could look like when they do a pattern approach um, for this is Hurricane Irene. And so you have all this data ahead of the storm to try to determine how strong the ridge is to see where the storm's going to actually go. And when they do this, a lot of times what you'll see is um, if you have no recon and then all of a sudden you have recon, 
the model track could do a shift, and typically that shift is typically more towards accuracy. And so it's a very important, vital what the model data is coming in, the, the model run that that data is getting adjusted to to pay close attention to any potential trends in the track. So I talked about late versus early. As I was saying before, late models basically, if I'm doing a forecast for a storm and I initialize the system at zero Z at this location at this strength, well, it's going to take you know a few hours for that data to get available for the model. So you have you know, the GFS, let's say this morning, 8 a.m. Eastern time is when I initialize my storm. I don't usually want to see the GFS data for about noon Eastern time. Uh, so that's considered late models to me. And so it's, it works the same for the HWERB, HMON, um, all the main dynamical models are considered late models because you have to take all that data and simulate it, which does take a little bit of time to do. The early models are simple models, and that's why they're available so quickly. If I can, as, like I said before, get that five minutes basically after I run the guidance, at least give me a little baseline of something that I'm looking at when I'm starting to do my forecast. But what we do is we take the late models, let's say it was 8 a.m. I initialized, I'm going to look at the previous model forecast, so the ones that were run off 6D data, and those are interpolated to the current position I did. So I have the model's information. It's just from the previous run. Uh, the odd table forecast, we mentioned the GFS and European. So there's uh, they have their own basically version of spaghetti plots available. Um, and so each member of it's known as a member model. So these apply, I said, forecast uncertainty, small spread, is usually high confidence in that model. Large spread may be low, low confidence. And so I'll show you an example of that here in a second. So here's the GFS uh, back with Dorian last year. Um, so you would say, okay, the clustering is pretty tight up through, I'd say about, about day five near the coast of Florida. Then it really starts spreading out as you get across Florida and into the Gulf of Mexico. It's, it's pretty much any of the northern Gulf Coast's game. We all know what happened with this system. Um, and so you kind of get a hint that things are spreading out as they approach Florida, so you might not want to take a lot of confidence into the track beyond there. Uh, when things are more highly clustered um, back to the east, we have a little bit of higher confidence. Although this did surprise almost all the models by shifting a little bit to the east because it's kind of relocated a little bit back towards Puerto Rico. That changed the whole game, really, by adding more time to the track of this storm. So ensemble forecast, uh, multi-model method. What I'm talking about here is how we're basically going to build a consensus model. And so if you take forecasts from different models at the same initial time, we piece them together um, to build a consensus. So there's three types at the bottom we're talking about, fixed, variable, and corrected. Um, fixed is basically you have, let's say, the GFS, the European, and, and Canadian model blend together evenly. They have to all be there. Um, variable, some of them can be missing, so the model will run either way, even if like the Canadian model is not ready yet at that point in time. And then corrected does a bias correction based on the expected past performance of the system. And so here's an example. So if you look at this uh, plot, the two top models are CVCE and CVCA. Those are consensus blends. And over on the left-hand part of the screen, CVCA is right up there. Um, just off the coast near West Palm Beach or so. Um, and so that's a blend of several models you see on this chart here. And so TVCA, we're just talking about those. Uh, TVCE is the blend of the GFS, EGRI is, sorry, EGRI is UK Met, and then it has HWERF, European, Lance PC, H1, and European Ensemble. So there's a lot of different blends here. You pretty much have an infinite amount of blends that we can come up with, but uh, folks are looking at what they do is can do post-processing to determine, well, what blends worked best last year and what could work good this year. So there's always some newer ones that um, come into play, uh, but they, depending on how the models are performing, the ones that are building these into these models, we can sometimes see one behave better than the other. Which is why you start seeing the weighted ones, like towards the bottom, the corrected models. Uh, you have a double weighted European based on the past pre previous performance of the European being good for the last several years. So here's an example of TBCN consensus and how it performed with Hurricane Ike. So it was right on the right on the mark. 
uh, for the 120, 120 hours out, um, compared to lead to uh, the no, uh, the nav, sorry, GFBL off to the right, it took uh, a blended in the UK Met Southern bias and blended in with the Europeans and GFS's Met Northern bias to create an average that was very close to what actually occurred. So I'm going to go through all these models I just talked about and show you an example from Joaquin. So here is the spaghetti pop in Joaquin. So the extrapolated motion model we talked about is uh, this one here. Basically, if you take extrapolation motion and just move it out over time where the storm's heading, obviously that's not what verified. However, it could be useful if the models are not handling the initial motion well in the short term. But beyond that time, it's not useful at all. But actually, this would have been very accurate over the first six hours for Lockheed. So climatology persistence, uh, we went over that one. Basically, it just says what typical storms have done over the past based on the current forward motion and intensity and size. Um, that's our baseline for other forecasts, and it's not used as a forecast tool because it has no skill. All the other models on top of that, now we're going into the global models. You have GFS, um, the UK Met, and the European. So look at the spread of these models. You have two that go inland in North Carolina, and one goes off the sea via past Bermuda. That's a large spreading global model, so we only have a low confidence forecast. They're the best, though, as far as models for TC track. They were developed for general weather forecasting because it has a global it has a global simulation of all these features that do the storms, therefore they're very accurate steering mechanisms of the storms, typically over time. However, the, some of the uh, disadvantages, they can't see the details of the TC inner core, and so if there's some sort of uh, changing of intensity, rapid intensification, or IO replacement cycle, something that causes these storms to wobble or interact differently with the atmosphere, um, they're not going to pick up on that. And so that can downstream exponentially affect the track forecast. Which brings us to regional hurricane models, which can do the inner cores very well. And so they're trying to play into what that effect could be. Um, so they're developed specifically for tropical cyclones. They're higher resolution. They can do these interactions between the TC and the environment. However, the limited coverage means if the TCs are, sorry, they're far away from the TC, um, like a high pressure ridge or, or a trough, let's say moving into the northwest of the United States, that uh, the global model might pick up on downstream would affect the tropical cyclone steering. It might not pick up on that as well. And so those come into play later on in the forecast, especially as far as what's going to steer these storms. And then we have consensus models. So these are the blended models that take into account the various models and the different weightings of them. Uh, and so these models show it clipping eastern North Carolina. Notice that these are farther east than um, two of the global models that's kind of in between, which is what we expect with these. And so typically the best track guides because it takes the best of the all worlds and blends them in together. Uh, it doesn't work when members forecast very different track scenarios. So we're showing in this particular case uh, the European way off by Bermuda. Well, because of the GFS and the UK Met being so far to the west, these models are at least a few hundred miles to the west of the UK, I'm sorry, of the European model, which is closer to what actually verified in this case. So these models are actually way off compared to the European model uh, in this particular example. Uh, so I'm going to go through some track model verification, how good these models have actually performed uh, as of late. Um, There's some uh, mathematical equation to tell you how we actually uh, Compare the statistics. Basically, you see Clipper, Clipper. So we're talking about comparison for Clipper. Um, and so how skillful is it compared to Clipper? Uh, so simplified is I've talked about the tabs, the shallow, medium, and deep one, and the climatology persistence. How much they vary over time. Uh, we're looking at uh, 120 hours. The official forecast is much more skillful, much less error than those models which is to be expected because those are very basic models. The best performing Atlantic track models, I've mentioned that you're kind of into the European. Well, look at the European. The last uh, uh, three years alone, European was best for the 48 96 hour forecast track. 
GFS occasionally gets in there. Occasionally you get the UK main H work, but generally speaking, the European has been best performing. So you, typically in this kind of scenario, you would want to think that the past performance is indicative of future results. Um, sometimes that can be the case, sometimes it isn't. But a lot of the model blending and consensus models are based off that premise. So last year, specifically last year, we look at the forecast still. Now, why don't you look at this chart a little bit? Why do you think it levels off as you get further out in time? Well, initially, still, comparatively to Clipper, is not that much higher because Clipper can be actually close to what happens at 12 hours. But obviously, climatology persistence becomes highly erroneous later on. So these models tend to level off. But what we're trying to look at is which one's most skillful. The dark black line is the official forecast. So we're happy we're probably the top three going past well, most time frames. We're in the top three or four. Uh, so we're doing pretty good there. And in fact, we're one of the best ones at 120 hours. Uh, the only ones that seem to be consistently outperforming us before that time frame would be like the Florida State Super Ensemble Consensus and uh, the European, which on that chart obviously showed that they are consistently performing best out of the global models. Pacific's fairly similar. Uh, the HICA, though, which is a, that's the, um, a corrected consensus that uh, one of our scientists works with uh, here at the Hurricane Center with some other researchers, um, that's for best performing one in the East Pacific. And uh, we, if you're on the call next week, I'll go into some details on how these also work for the intensity uh, skills as well. So we're talking about serial correlation. So I, little details I'd like to say at the Hurricane Center, we don't just blindly look at the models. Serial correlations kind of describes what we try to do uh, at the Hurricane Center. So I said past performance can be indicative of future results, especially if you're looking at the same storm over the past day or two. So, for example, if the GFS has been really hitting the mark uh, yesterday and today as far as the uh, verification real time, we're going to tend to favor that track. And so that helps us with uh, improving our performance at the Hurricane Center and determining which model in this particular storm is maybe handling the steering flow a little bit better. Uh, so a uh, model might be really good today on a storm, but the next storm two weeks from now, it might not be handling it well. And we've already seen that happen this hurricane season. So the error trends generally, other than a little blip last year, with uh, we had a a late season storm Sebastian that really uh, had some high errors because the models had a really bad time determining how much it would accelerate uh, over the open Atlantic. And so um, several hundred miles of error, but over a temporal distance, it was interesting. So we weren't necessarily left or right by hundreds of miles. We were slow by hundreds of miles or sometimes too fast. So that helped play into some of the little bit higher errors last year in the Atlantic. These pack as that had a little bit of an error increase as well, but you just want to look at the overall trend uh, that has been an onward-downward trend. Uh, basically, is we're, what we're looking at is because of the fact that the models are getting better. We're looking at higher-resolution models. These, um, they're, they're just picking up on the features overall better. So all the forecast parameters we do in addition to just forecasting track, we do intensity. Uh, we have our tropical weather outlook. We do our formation forecast within five days or two days. We forecast the size, so we have the radius of winds. Uh, storm surge, we have a storm surge unit inside the hurricane center. Uh, so about 48 hours prior, they start running pea surge. There's also surge information available well before that time. We call noms and meows. You can actually look at potential scenarios for your location uh, based on that information. Uh, rainfall by the WPC, they provide rainfall forecasts. Uh, SPC provides tornado risk. Um, 12 foot seas uh, right next door in our building is the tropical analysis forecast branch um, and the ocean prediction center. We get the 12 foot seas from them. Uh, what also we get is uh, not listed here is the Dvorak estimates of intensity uh, from both the satellite analysis branch and from the TAF B. So, in a nutshell, the dynamical models generally outperform the simpler techniques that I outlined. And no single model is always the best. One good model, one storm could be bad the next storm. So a consensus approach is good to try to blend in those errors over time. So for either year, storm to storm, forecast, the forecast variability, 
it helps build in that information. Um, and we can correct those a little bit over time um, to, to make them improve year to year. However, we talked about zero correlation. One of our jobs at the Hurricane Center is to look at things and adjust it mentally to say, okay, this model is performing the best. I'm going to wait this one a little bit more as I'm looking at it now. Um, and all these models, including the globals and the regional ones, are going to continue to improve as we get better computing power and we do more research to determine what is causing the errors in the models themselves and how we can improve upon those. A whole bunch of web links. Uh, you can refer back to this. Uh, this one's being recorded, so you can refer back to this additional information uh, to get all this information about these models. We want to dig deeper into how they operate. Actually, I'll leave that on here. Uh, if, I'll pass this back over to Andrea and Dan. Um, do you have any questions? Okay, great. Thanks, Andy. Um, so, Brian, do you want to open up the, the phones? And we'd be happy to take some, some questions now. Um, and just to note that we'll also post the PowerPoint presentation so that you can easily access all these links uh, after the fact. So, any questions? Yeah, hi, Andy. I um, just have a quick question. So, one of my um, uh, largest concerns um, this summer is the lack of international travel and its effect on the global models. How do you guys plan on accounting for that? Are uh, you referring to uh, how aircraft data could be ingested into the model? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if anything has been done to try to adjust for that factor. Um, I guess it could be a variability there. Uh, as far as at least what we have, though, is the aircraft recon. We don't have any impacts from that at this point. Um, so that's going to be helpful. So if we do have storms, they can collect data in and around the storms. Um, so hopefully the fact that we have better data simulation for the satellites themselves globally, that will hopefully be sufficient for this year. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Hey, Andrea, it's Brian. Um, a question, uh, is the GLM data, the, the lightning mapper data, do you know if that's being assimilated into any of the models yet? That's um, a great as far question. as I, oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, go ahead. No, feel free. As far as I know, it's not. Um, I did check the stat, some of the, the status sheets on what was actively being assimilated, and as of yet, I haven't seen it. But maybe, maybe you have some fresh news, Andy. <laughs> I don't in front of me. You might want to go to some of the H. I would look more towards the like the HWORF documentation to see um, if it's being done with them. Um, mm -hmm. But now you mentioned, I, I want to bring a point. This is not to do a track forecasting, but the GLM data is uh, going to become increasingly useful for operations over the oceans. Um, and we're talking about marine interests. So we have a ship out at sea. If they see uh, convective organization in GLM data, they can try to avoid, uh, they can try to maneuver to not hit, be hit by severe weather out there. And that's something big that we haven't had before. Um, we don't have convective watches and warnings over the ocean. Um, so we're kind of giving them a heads up where they might not have that availability. <laughs> so it's, it's gonna be good for that regard. Uh, but I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know off the top of the head if they're using that or not. Yeah, and just so everyone knows, GLM stands for Geostationary Lightning Mapper. That is a lightning detection um, system that we have up on our geostationary satellites, goes east and goes west. So you can basically see lightning all over the, the Atlantic domain, which is awesome <laughs> and great for safety, it turns out. So, um, any other questions? I have one more, Andrea, if we don't have yeah. a, a question. Um, so, Andy, with the three water vapor channels on the uh, GOES imagers, mm -hmm. are you able to make any or discern any key uh, influences of um, troughs or other weather systems at the large scale like you were talking about? that would affect the uh, track forecast? As far as track is concerned, I mean, I guess 
I, th- I suppose what you can do is with those is when you see like an upper trough analyzed in the models, you can try to look at the different levels of water vapor and determine how deep that trough is. Um, and so whether or not it's going to be affecting the system at the certain levels. Um, it can also probably help you determine what kind of shear might be affecting the storm uh, because you different, see the different shearing flows at different heights there. Um, to me, it'd be more, it's more useful for um, intensity um, because one great example is when we're looking for south, uh, we see the, uh, the water vapor energy at the different levels. Say, okay, is, is this dry air going to be impacting the system at the low levels, low levels and mid levels? And it helps us determine to what extent some of this uh, interactions with those weather systems will be. Okay, thanks. Okay, I do have one question, Andy. If you don't mind, um, just would you mind sharing with us just what does hurricane forecasting look like um, this year? We're in an unprecedented time, so um, what are you guys doing? <laughs> So what are we doing operation at the hurricane center to, to, make, yeah. to make things work? Okay. So how are you making it I, work and, and how you doing? <laughs> so I have um, set up here right where I'm sitting. I have two laptops. I have one is a, uh, a windows laptop and next to me is a government laptop. The government laptop can run um, almost everything we do uh, at the hurricane center. Uh, so I can issue a, a tropical cyclone forecast. I can uh, issue a tropical weather outlook. Um, right here at home. Uh, there's certain things we have set up we have to do at work. Uh, for example, if there's watches or warnings for the United States, there's aircraft reconnaissance data coming in, there's certain things we need to do there um, to make things work. It's, it's too tricky, in other words, to try to make it work from home. But if we have a system out in the Middle East Pacific, um, we can do that pretty much with the same, the same skill we would have there. Um, so we've made it work to try to minimize the number of people at the office uh, by doing it this way. And so it's helped out a bit. It, it, uh, we can interact just as easily. We have, you know, if Google Hangouts, you can do conference calls that way. Um, and uh, so we have we have the meeting range coordination call with the weather forecast offices. We do it that way at, at this point in time. Um, hurricane hotline, though, we, we do things from at the hurricane center when we're inside that region um, for the hurricane hotline. Um, so thus far, we've been, um, we've had actually, we had some landfalls. I've been in the office for uh, Cristobal. I've been in the office for Bertha. Uh, they both made landfall while I was there at work. Um, but we make it work uh, in those scenarios. Great, thanks. It does sound like you guys definitely have it all covered. So, <laughs> um, working days, there's a lot of scientists working very hard to make sure that everything's, everything's good to go. Yeah. Excellent. Um, any other questions? Yeah, yeah Andrew. Is... Oh. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, hey, Brian. Uh, this is Dan in Tampa. I'm just wondering, the uh, Visit website has the 2016 version of this PowerPoint. Uh, when will this current version be available? Um, is Dan on the line still? Or? Yeah, once you... Uh, make it available to me, Andrea. I'll put it on the web page. So very soon after okay. I get it from Andrea and, and the recording here, probably within an hour, I'll say. Yeah, within an hour will be. I'll send it right after this. So. All right, thanks. Yeah, and feel free, everyone, feel free to distribute this. We would definitely um, like this to be a resource for people this year to get caught up on what's going on. Okay, Brian, I've got one more. Yeah. Wrap it up. Yep. So, um, Andrew, Andrew, you didn't mention um, the wrap of the hurt. Could you comment on whether that falls into the consideration for the short term forecast? Andrew, are you are you answering that one, or is that for me? Oh, um, I, you guys look at the wrap and the her very much. Um, I guess I, I was always under the impression that that was not necessarily high on the list. But. <laughs> we don't build it into our regular forecasting. I know when there's, I look at them when it comes to near landfall scenarios um, to try to just gauge like the timing of onset of things. 
Um, I won't necessarily use it for saying, okay, this is when the Tropical Storm Force winds are going to happen, or this is going to be this is going to be how strong it's going to be. It kind of gives me an idea, though, if like um, someone asked, like, so when are the when are the conditions going to go downhill? Like, well, they show a lot of convection reaching the coast at a certain time frame. You might be able to give an idea from that. Um, one other thing I do look at them for is actually, and I don't, I don't. I can't give you a numerical uh, how much this is weighted into things, but I can look at those things when they're closer to shore for Genesis. Um, so, like for example, if the um, ARW uh, shows something turning in the eastern Gulf of Mexico and uh, some of the other models are showing that, I'm like, okay, well, at least the high-res models are picking up on that too. So it might give me a little bit more confidence when I'm doing near shore Genesis in those situations. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Um, last chance. Any more questions? Okay. Um, hearing none. Thank you so much, uh, Andy. This was really interesting. And um, for everyone listening, of course, thank you for participating as well. And uh, this will be available within the hour, we would say, uh, on the visit website and uh, the, both the recording and the PowerPoint. And we will be having another one of these uh, next Tuesday at the same time, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern, on intensity models. So please join us for that if you are able, and uh, feel free to pass that information along to your colleagues. And uh, I think that we're ready to wrap it up. So thanks again, Andy.